We are going to finish up um, our class on the content this week. We are going to go back and finish what we did not, uh, were not able to get to last week. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and get your Bible and go back to Romans 14, uh, we'll look at Romans 14 and, and Romans uh, 15 a little bit. I think, and you can correct me, I think this is where we stopped. I think we got through six. Is that, is that right? Does anybody have detailed notes of where we, where we finished before we opened Pandora's box? We were on nine. We were on nine. Oh, great. We finished seven. Okay, finished seven, uh, and we were, we were on eight. Okay, great. Uh, well, let's, one, four, any, anything we need to talk about? Any, any outstanding questions, things, issues we need to discuss before we jump in and, and try to finish today? All right. Well, great. Uh, so we remember we're walking through sort of the the twelve principles of how to live with someone, a brother, when we disagree on on tertiary matters. Right? We disagree on uh, disputable matters, not essential things. If you go back, think about that triage. We're talking about the third circle. Um, this is how do we love people uh, even when we might disagree with them. So number eight is disagreements about eating and drinking are not important in the kingdom of God, right? That building each other up in righteousness, peace, and joy is the important thing, right? That, so often we take these disagreements about tertiary matters, which do matter. You need to have an opinion on them, but they are not more important than building each other up in righteousness, peace, and joy. Uh, and when we make them more important than building each other up in righteousness, peace, and joy, that's often when we do relational damage, right? That's when we, uh, we sin against each other, uh, when we make these, these issues more important uh, than what the Bible has called us to, building up each other up in righteousness, uh, peace, and joy. I don't think we need to camp there any longer. That makes sense to everybody? All right, number nine. If you have freedom, don't flaunt it. If you're strict... Don't expect others to be strict like you. So look at uh, Romans 14, 22. Sorry, I'm not in Romans. That's why I was like, that is not right. Uh, Romans 14, 22. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. For whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, but the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. The beginning of 22, he says, the faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. That If you have freedom, it doesn't mean that you should always go around and flaunt your freedom, right? You might have freedom on a particular issue. It doesn't mean that you should try to make that freedom broadcast as widely as possible, um, and if you are stricter, right, if you feel like you don't have freedom on that issue, it's not fair for you to expect everyone to be strict like you, right, that your conscience is for you. Remember, this is bring your own conscience. Your conscience is for you. Your conscience is not for other people. Freedom, don't seek to flaunt it, throw it in people's faces. And if you are stricter on an issue, um, you can't expect everyone to be as strict as you on every uh, tertiary issue. Number 10, a person who lives according to their conscience is blessed. All right, blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. All right, whoever, but whoever doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We talked about this as one of the principles in the very first week, is that it is bad practice to, to try to stuff down your conscience. Right? It's bad practice. Now, you can calibrate your conscience. That's a different thing. We've, we've spent some time, hopefully, Giving you some categories, but to think about that, it's, it's not a wrong thing to calibrate your conscience, to, to seek to conform your conscience to the will of God, but it's bad practice to try to ignore your conscience, to stuff it down, to, to act as if it doesn't matter, right? that you ought to live according to your conscience, right? so that you might seek to inform your conscience, you might ask other people about their positions on certain tertiary matters, you might uh, have discussions, you might change your mind, right? you might change your opinion on a particular tertiary issue. But you, what you shouldn't do is, is stuff your conscience down, is ignore your conscience. Why, why should we not ignore our conscience? What does that do to your conscience? It sears your conscience, right? It, it, it lowers the, the warning signal, right? It makes it harder to hear when you do need it. So seek to calibrate your conscience, but, but live according to your conscience. That blesses the man uh, who isn't condemned when he eats. So wherever you land on a tertiary issue, remember last week, we, we looked at Paul said, everyone should be convinced in his own mind. Wherever you land, be there, right? And follow your own conscience. You, you cannot do something because your friend does it. And you, you can't not do something because your friend doesn't do it, right? You have to determine where you are and follow your own conscience, not the conscience of, of other people. Does that make sense, right? So 
Live according to your conscience, even as you seek to, to calibrate your conscience to the will of God. Number 11 and 12, we'll put these together. We must follow the example of Christ who put others first. And then 12, we bring glory to God when we welcome one another as, as Christ has, has welcomed us. Look at what he says in, in, um, in verse 1 of 15. We who are strong, right, that's the strong conscience, have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves, right? The, the strong conscience has an obligation to not just exercise his freedom regardless of the context, but the strong has an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in our former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. And may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may have one voice, you may with one voice glorify the the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Right? So that we talked about last week, that the big issue that helps us to navigate these, these disputable matters is the issue of love. If we love our brothers and sisters, whether we are on the stronger side of conscience on the issue or we're on the weaker side, that we can have love for one another. So if you're on the stronger side, you can love your weaker brother by sometimes in certain contexts not exercising your freedom. Not because you're not allowed to, not because you don't have that freedom, but for the sake of loving your brother. Uh, and the same goes for the, those on the weaker side. We exercise love of those who might have a stronger conscience on a particular issue by not assuming the worst of them, by assuming that they might be partaking for the glory of God, that they, they're honoring God, that we're not seeking to judge them. And those with a stronger conscience, they're not seeking to be arrogant towards the weaker, that we, we have this idea of love. The, the, we, we talked about this a bit last week. One of the hard, reasons this is so hard for us is because we have this sense of, if I can do it, if I am allowed to do it, I should always be able to do it. Right? If, if, I, if, if I can eat meat, if Paul says I can eat the meat, why, why would I ever not eat the meat? Right? That's, that's, that is allowing somebody else to determine what I do. And Paul says, no, we have an obligation to our weaker brothers. We have an obligation to not make them stubble, that we want to, to care for them in love. So there might be times in which we would give up our freedom, right? We would forego that freedom in order to not make them stumble. Paul does this. Paul says, I have the right to receive money from the churches. But there are times in his ministry when Paul for, forgo that, for, for, for gone, for, gave up that right. <laughs> I don't know what word I was looking for. There are times that Paul forfeited that right and said, I'm choosing not to receive money lest people think that I am peddling the gospel, right? That, that by me receiving money, which I'm allowed to do, that that might cause some people to not listen to what I'm saying. It might cause some people to assume that I'm preaching only to make money, and that would be a stumbling block, and I don't want to put that stumbling block. So there are times that Paul doesn't receive support in order that he may not lay a stumbling block. Not because he's not allowed to, or because it was sinful, but Paul uh, freely gives up his freedom, right? Gives up his right for the sake of of, of his, his brother. So if you think about some of the tertiary issues that we've talked about, what's, a, what's maybe an example of when we might give up a freedom, right? We might lay down our right for the sake of a weaker brother. Right? So if you're, on the, if you, if you're in the spot where you feel like, hey, I feel free to drink, right? You might, when you bring over a brother who has a different conviction, right? You might make a different choice about what's served uh, in your home, in order to not cause that brother to stumble. Television, Television right? right? When you're together, uh, especially if those of you that got kids, you know when your kids get together with other people's kids, uh, finding a movie, if they all want to get together and watch a movie, sometimes that's difficult, right? Because every family might draw the lines at slightly different places. And so figuring out what does that look like, and so it's not judging the, the choices that other families make within a certain sphere of acceptable things, uh, but, but finding a way to, maybe we could pick something that everybody would like, right? That I'm not trying to, to violate their conscience. Uh, that's true not just with our kids, but that's true with adults, right? That we might land on different places uh, on what your conscience does or does not allow you to, to watch. The way your dress. Mm, yeah, the way your teenagers dress. Yeah, that's a, I'm not looking forward to those days. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, how we... Even just parenting choices uh, of how different choices people make, uh, one, we almost never know the full um, circumstances, right? We see a piece, and it's really easy to make judgments about what people should or shouldn't do. We can be gracious to one another in those things. 
What else? Any other examples? Wearing masks, mask, right? Where we can be gracious and kind. I, we talked about this a bit last week. I think it's always helpful until proven otherwise. Especially for believers, for brothers, just to assume that they're trying their best. Right? To assume that they're doing what they're doing for the honor of God. Whether they, they chose to or chose not to, to. That they were trying to honor the Lord. They were trying to do what was right. Halloween. Who said Halloween? Yeah, yeah. Halloween's a, Halloween's a good one, right? Well, uh, uh, I just was talking to Herschel last week, and he took some phone calls and some emails last week of people saying, "I don't know how to think about this, right? What do I do?" And I was like, "Well, you just tell them to come to my class, and, uh, <laughs> and we'll give them the categories." Uh, but yeah, Halloween. Like some families participate, some don't, uh, and it's really easy on when you fall on either side to either become arrogant towards the others or become judgmental towards the ones that do participate. And we can have graciousness towards one another. Santa Claus, Claus, right? Uh, Yeah. 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 So we don't do Santa, uh, not for like deep convictional reasons, mainly because I want my kids to realize I bought those presents, right? Your dad bought dad bought those for you. Not a fictional man. We worked hard to buy those things for you. Uh, but I'll tell you, when people find out we don't do Santa, it's like that we brought Santa out and murdered him in front of the children. I mean, it, it is like, for a lot of people, it's a big deal. So those issues can be very emotional because why does that matter to adults? It's because it's tied to their childhood. It's tied to all these, what they experience. These things are hard when they're, they come with a lot of emotion. Uh, it can be sometimes hard to be gracious to one. I'm fine if you do Santa, by the way. I don't I'm fine. It doesn't bother me. All right. Questions? Anything else we need to say about how to disagree with a brother uh, on a disputable matter? This, can we close week five, generally? Okay. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's finish up. Let's go, to, let's go to week, this says week seven, but it's week, week six. So the last thing we want to do this, this, in this class is to talk about how should, you, how should you relate to people in other cultures when your consciences disagree. So largely, the, the things we've talked about are matters that would come up when we share a similar culture, right? We all live in Frankfurt, or we're all in Kentucky, we're all in the South, and most of us have grown up, if not in the same place, in similar places. Our culture is, is pretty similar. What do you do when you go to a different place, right? If you go to where's, where Zach and the, uh, the rest of the, the, uh, that team is, Fort Collins is an entirely different culture. If you go uh, overseas, right, you go where Corbin is. It's an entirely different culture. You go somewhere else. What brings in all sorts of other issues of how we might disagree on, on matters of conscience because we have enough disagreement when we share the same culture, and it's going to grow even more when we, we have a completely different culture. So when I say culture... I mean just the way that individual peoples think about the world, the way they see the world, the, the things they value, the things they care about. So, if, for instance, uh, in America, we, we value time matters a lot. Uh, if you are consistently, if you have a job and you're consistently 15 minutes late for your meetings, what, what is eventually somebody going to say to you? Yeah, is your time more important than that? Stop coming late to meetings. No, we had the meeting was at 9. You need to be here at 9, right? We value punctuality. We, right, if, if you invited somebody over to your house and you said dinner's at 6 and they showed up at 7.30, you would think, what? You would be sitting there thinking, what in the world? Why, why have they done this? Right? That's, we value time. We value punctuality, punctuality. That's not true in every part of the world. I, I've spent time with Kenny and Cheryl in, uh, uh, in Panama. And in Panama... They care much more about relationship than they do about time. And so even when we were together, even when they were like, hey, we have these plans, right? There's these things that we're going to do. The, the, the natives that are with Katie and Cheryl are like, oh, those things will be there tomorrow. You won't be here tomorrow. We want to spend time with you. We want, we want, to, to, have, we want to value this relationship uh, that even, right, even if you came over and you're like, hey, we're going to leave at 8, uh, they may not leave your house until 11 or 12 because they value that relationship. They don't see that as rude. Right when when we would have services with Kenny and Cheryl, like, well, what time's the service going to start? Kenny's like, oh yeah, that's not how that works. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, yeah, well, you, you, you know this, JP. Like, well, the service is going to be in the morning. Like, well, when? Well, when everybody gets there, right? We uh, we would go to this little uh, village called Hockey. Uh, now the, there is no longer a flight. Kenny has to take a boat out onto the ocean to get there. But uh, uh, JP and I were on a trip. We were there, uh, and uh, a plane runs like one day a week, only on Mondays. And so on Monday, we're like, what time? 
what time do we need to be to go to, you know, to walk back over to the airstrip? And they're like, I don't know, Monday. And it's like, what do you mean? Well, the plane will come on Monday. Well, yeah, what time does the plane come? Monday. And it's like, we don't know. No one cares. That's not how they think. The plane will be there at some point on Monday. You pack your stuff up, and you be close to the airstrip. And when the plane comes, that's when it comes. Now, for Americans, that was really disconcerting. Like, no, I, I want to know. Right? I have a flight in the morning. I know exactly when my flight is. I know when I need to get there. Right? If I showed up and they're like, I don't know, we'll leave sometime today, I would be frustrated. In Panama, that's not how it works. Time works differently. Right? <clears throat> there, what, what is, seems offensive to my sensibilities doesn't bother the locals. Right? Time is a different thing. Uh, they view time differently. They value relationships over, over time. There are benefits to that. There are downfalls to that. Right? Uh, value, uh, valuing time, punctuality, there are benefits to that. There are also downfalls to that, right? It's not that one is necessarily better than the other. They're, they're, just, uh, they're just different. Uh, in the, uh, if you think about, I'm going to throw this up. I'm going to read you this example that, uh, that J.D. gives us. Uh, J.D. Uh, is Crowley, one of the, the authors, was a missionary in Cambodia uh, for many years. Uh, he, he writes about a particular issue that he had when he got there that he didn't understand about the locals uh, that caused a, a bit of a disagreement. He says, um, I planted a mango tree in my yard in Cambodia, and on the fourth year, when fruit normally starts to appear, it produced a grand total of three mangoes, and they were pitiful. But that couldn't dampen my excitement for the day when I could slice off some of that golden goodness and savor my very own homegrown mangoes. But that day never came. A local friend of mine who was doing some concrete work for me picked and ate the mangoes, all three of them. And worse yet, he seemed completely without remorse, right? A sign, J.D. says, that I was sure it was, uh, uh, that he had a seared conscience. But he said, but there was a less sinister explanation. He felt no pangs of conscience because in his culture, what he did wasn't wrong. The real wrong in the situation was my stinginess. That in most cultures around the world, including ancient Israel, uh, it was not considered theft to pick a handful of grain or fruit or a fruit or two while you were taking a shortcut through someone's field as long as you didn't do any serious harvesting. That for most Western missionaries, though, that would constitute two violations of personal property, trespassing and theft. But both my culture and the Cambodian culture have a strong moral code against theft, but the difference is in the details. Right? So he said, the real scandal of the event was my stinginess, not my friend's theft as I perceived it. And at that point, I realized that I had to make two calibrations to my own moral compass. First, I had to have a category of stinginess towards neighbor to, to add to my list of wrongs. Stinginess towards neighbor is, is hardly ever on the radar of most U.S. citizens. Where most people around the world revere, where, where in America we people revere personal property rights and think they're quoting scripture when they say God helps those who help themselves. But in most other cultures, it's a cardinal sin. That food especially is to be shared with those that are around you. And second, I had to adjust my conscience concerning personal property rights. That later, while walking through an orchard in Cambodia, a friend handed me some freshly picked fruit. Because I had calibrated my conscience, I felt completely free to eat it, even though we had not yet asked the owner, right? Of course, he says these rules have stipulation. There are, right, if he had climbed a wall to get there, there are, right, they're, they're, they still care about theft. So if you look at the, the example, right, so you have the missionary conscience, you have J.D.'s conscience, and then you have the conscience of his friend, right? They don't line up, especially when we cross cultures. That they, they often are very different. That J.D. Had, was particularly burdened by taking somebody else's fruit, but his friend was burdened that J.D. was stingy with his food. Why would you not want to share? Right? Why? You have fruit in your guy. Why would you not want to share that with me? Uh, that both needed some, uh, some, some calibration. So this is a good example. He says the Cambodians care about theft. They have a moral code about theft. But what is considered theft is going to look different, right? That uh, we're not always the same. If you go into somebody's house and they have a bowl of candy out, right? They have a bowl of... Uh, candy corn, right? They're trying to l- <laughs> trying to look generous, but hope, right? <laughs> if you go into someone's house and they have a bowl of candy corn out, what is that signal? You can have some, right? Now, if you go into their cabinet and you open it up and you pop open the bag, that's different. But if you go there and it's an open area, it's sitting out, right? Culturally, you know that is a signal that this is okay. That reaching in and grabbing a couple pieces is not stealing, right? You Right, you, you and they both may agree that theft is wrong. You reaching in and taking some candy corn is not theft, right? It, it is, you understand the cultural context. It's the same thing JT says in, in Cambodia, right? That culturally, if you're walking through somebody's field, to reach up and pick a mango, reach up and pick a piece of fruit, 
is not a problem, right? As long as you're not doing serious harvesting, you're not damaging things, that no one in Cambodia would, would see that as theft in the same way that nobody would see you walking into somebody's house and picking up a piece of candy out of the bowl. No one sees that as theft. It would, it would be perfectly acceptable. But for American conscience, for American culture, we, we find that weird, right? If I came home and there was a guy in my tree in my front yard, we would have a discussion, right? Uh, like, why are you here? Please get out of my yard, right? I, I don't, I, we, we feel very different about our property rights. We're very, very different about trespassing, about all those sort of things. So it's, it's a helpful example of when we cross cultures, uh, sometimes there are just going to be things that are lost in translation. Uh, so this is especially true if you ever serve overseas, but this might be true, again, if you move to other places in the U.S. You can go to Fort Collins. It is a completely different culture, right? You go to California. It's a different world, right? It's a, you go to Texas. It's a different world. You, you go to different places. Uh, re- recently, I, I used to always think Kentucky was the South. Until recently, I spent some time in deep South Alabama. And then I realized, oh, Kentucky is not the South, right? We are, we are sort of the South, but we are not the South. It's a very different culture there. Understanding where you are helps you to understand sometimes why our consciences, uh, consciences might, might differ. So in the, in the book, they talk about using the ally of the conscience uh, and, and in, in evangelism, that when we go to other cultures, understanding that everybody, regardless of culture, everybody has a conscience because they're made in the image of God, right? And that conscience may be different because of their culture, but everybody does have a conscience. But there are three dangers uh, that we have to, to watch out for, three things that we don't want to misunderstand when we seek to, to reach people from different cultures. Uh, number one is preaching against sins that are not truly sins in any culture, right? If you go to Africa and you plant a church in Africa, and you come from uh, a holiness background where you were taught there should be no instruments ever in worship services. If you plant a church in Africa, right, you could spend a lot of time teaching them right, there should be no instruments ever in, a- in worship services. Now, I would argue, I don't think the Bible teaches that. right? I don't, I don't, that's, that's a sin according to your sensibilities, but it's not a sin from the Bible. Right? So you could go to these other cultures, and we can spend time preaching against sins, trying to burden people's conscience over sins that they're not burdened over, but that aren't really sins, right? that are really more cultural things, really things that we care more about. Right? You could, again, we could have spent, JP when we were in, and I were, when we were with Kenny and Cheryl, we could have spent a lot of time trying to burden the conscience of the locals to say, hey, we, we were going to try to start the service at 930, and you guys didn't show up to 10, and we're very disappointed in you, and we're, we feel disrespectful. We, we could have right, tried to burden their conscience, or we could understand we're the only people here who cared about that, right? It, burdened, it bothered us, but it bothered nobody else, right? Understanding some of the differences. So we don't want to preach against sins that are not truly sins in any culture. Right? Number two is preaching against a true sin, but in a way that the local culture doesn't understand. Right? So to go back to the, the mango example, right? JT could have pulled his friend aside and said, theft is wrong. And what would his friend say? Yeah, theft is wrong. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I agree with you. And he says, well, you shouldn't have taken my man. And he says, I don't see how the two are related. <laughs> right? They, they can agree that theft is wrong, that theft is a sin, but sometimes there's, we're, we're going to have different understandings of exactly what does that look like uh, in, in the culture. So we want to, right, in trying to, to, to prick the culture of somebody in Cambodia, you might use theft, but you're going to have to actually talk about theft in a way that they understand and in a way that is considered theft in, in, their, in their culture. So we want to preach against true sins, uh, but in a way that the local culture, culture can understand. And number three, the danger is that we undervalue then the values or the virtues of local cultures, right? That, that there are, even as we think about what the church looks like globally, what a service would look like is going to... Res- Right? I think a faithful service is going to have a lot of the same elements. Right? There's going to be prayer. There's going to be believers there. Right? It's going to be a gathering of believers. There's going to be scripture reading. There's going to be faithful preaching of the word. Right? There's going to be the ordinances, right? whether the Lord's Supper or baptism. But I think those pieces, faithful churches all around the world, but those pieces are consistent. Now, what does the room look like? What do the chairs look like? What does the music sound like? What instruments are in the worship service? What do people wear? Right? What, what time of day does it happen on Sunday? Those things might look very different depending on where you are in the culture, right? Depending on where you go. There are lots of churches in Africa, for, for instance, that refuse to use drums in their services. You know why? Because a lot of them have come out of animism. A lot of them have come out of dark religions in which drums in their culture are associated with idol worship. And so, there's, is it sinful to use drums in the service? I don't think so, right? It's not sinful. 
And it's a cultural thing. We, we, you can like it or not like it, but I don't think it's sinful. But they have said, we're not going to use those because for us, right, it, 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 it seems to associate us with things we don't want to be associated with. Right? That might look different. Right? There was a time, now everybody loves piano. Right? There was a time in American evangelicalism where you, no one wanted piano in the services. Do you know why? Yeah, it was the saloon instrument, right? The piano was the, was the instrument of the drunkards, right? Did every, now, we would never, we don't think about pianos that way. You don't see somebody sit down to play a piano and think, man, they've spent a lot of time in saloons. You don't, that's not, we don't think about that. But, again, that was part of the culture. When you go to other places, some of the accidents of that worship service may look different, right? What people wear, uh, what time of day it is, what instruments they use, what does the music sound like, all those sort of things are, are going to sometimes be very, very different. Uh, and that, that's, that's okay, right? Well, you don't, I wouldn't want to go into a church in Africa and, and tell them, you must use drums. No, that would be foolish. I can respect their culture. I can respect the unique aspects of where they are and understanding that they probably know their culture better than I do. Right? Again, the essential elements of worship are going to be the same in faithful churches from now until Jesus comes, wherever you, you are. Right? They're, the essential elements are still going to be there. What exactly those look like may look a little bit different. Right? If Buck Run is here in 100 years... Our songs are probably going to, we might be singing some of the same songs, but we might be singing some different songs, right? That dress might be, look different. The building might look a little bit different. The chairs, well, the chairs will probably still be there, right? Well, uh, right? We, 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 the, the accents, some of those things might look a little bit different, but we can, we can respect and, and understand some of the virtues of local cultures uh, when we understand that some things that we would want to press on them are not, are not really biblical sins, are not biblical virtues, but things that we enjoy because of our culture, because of our preferences uh, that we shouldn't press on them. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, so I think there, there is that line there. If I were planting a church in a cross-cultural setting, whether internationally or whether somewhere, somewhere else in the States that just was a different culture, I think it is wholly appropriate and required to say your, your church must look different than the culture. Right, so to go back to the African example, I think, it's a, I think it's probably really appropriate that a lot of African churches say, we're not going to use drums, right? Because that is a way they're saying, we're breaking from what we came from. We want it to be clear we're not what we were before we came to Christ. And this is a clear way, we, this is a way we can do that. We're not, we're not, we are not them. I think there is a temptation in cultures to look like the culture, right? To whatever, in the wrong ways, right? That there are in the sinful ways. And I think it's wholly appropriate. So I think about, in Fort Collins, uh, there is a ton of pressure. One, there are just very few churches in Fort Collins in general. And there is a ton of pressure for churches that do exist to essentially be civic organizations, right? They're like food banks. Zach has a lot of pressure, basically, to not talk about anything. Well, Zach has just said, we're not going to do that here, right? We're going to so he preaches the Bible. He talks about issues, which for, for native Fort Collanders is a real weird thing, right? They... When they, if they've ever been to church at all, period, it's been really shallow. And so when they come to, uh, to Zach's church and they hear that preaching, and they, it's, it's a very stark contrast of like, oh, we're talking about, one, we're talking about the Bible, but we're talking about sins, we're talking about issues. Or we're, Zach, Zach is speaking to things like gender and sexuality and all the things that are in, that are in the scriptures when they're in the text. Uh, I think that's wholly appropriate. Rather than to say, well, you know, in our culture, they don't really talk about much, so we're going to do that. Uh, I would say that's part of the essentials of what it means to be a body, is that you're going to have to preach the text. You're going to have to preach the Bible. Um, but yeah, so sometimes we need to push back on the other side because we don't want to draw that line well enough. Now, like Zach doesn't wear a coat and tie when he preaches. I, I think it will probably not be the wisest move to wear a coat and tie when he preaches in Fort Collins, right? People would think... Most people who aren't believers would see that and think he's a huckster, right? Would think he is like Benny Hinn. Now, like, because nobody, that's not how they dress. That's, that's, not, that's not normal. Now, it's not how Zach dresses either, so that helps. Uh, <laughs> but, it, so, like, that's a piece that Zach wearing, like, his regular shoes and, like, khakis and a, and a short sleeve button-up, that fits perfectly there. I don't think there's anything biblically wrong with that. It causes no stumbling block to people. It's like, it is still within a what I would consider appropriate attire for a church. I'm thinking that level of like, yeah, if you're going to go plant a church in Fort Collins, it's probably not a good idea to say, okay, we're planting a church where everybody wears a coat and tie. It's going to be hard. That's an unnecessarily stumbling, unnecessary stumbling block. The same is true. I've told guys when I've, I've taught for, for Dr. York before in pastoral ministry, guys have sometimes said, well, I, this church wants me to come pastor there. 
but they want me to wear a coat and tie, so I'm not going to do it. Well, that's a stupid reason to not go pastor a church, right? That, that, if you feel like the Lord is leading you there and they want you to come and you feel like you've got the gifts that you could come and serve them, then that's, that's a really silly reason to not go pastor a church. That, that's, that is putting your preference over, over serving the Lord. So go buy a coat and tie and go preach in it. You're gonna be, you'll, you'll survive, I promise. Like, so I think both sides of that, sometimes we need to be pushed. It's, the idea is not that we, would, is that we wouldn't put our preferences over necessarily over somebody else's, and that we would keep the main things, the main things. We would, we would have all the essential elements there, um, but that not would not let the, the non-sinful preferences, the things that are neutral, essentially, that we wouldn't let those dominate the characteristics of what we, what we look like. I think that's what separates most churches, is that most churches were way, well, okay, when I say most churches, I mean of this group over here. Uh, most churches, we are way more like theologically, than, than we mo- most of the time know, and we feel way different, but almost all the time that feeling is all the accidents, is we, well, we dress different, our music sounds different, that sort of stuff. We're really not that different. Some of that is just preference stuff, which is okay. That's some, like, pre- some preference stuff is okay. It's not wrong to like a certain style of music necessarily, with, again, within certain bounds. But yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Is that it? Question, answer, make sense? Yeah. I think about when I do premarital counseling, I always like can talk through stuff like you and your spouse, you both think you know what clean is. And I promise that you do not have the same understanding of clean. You just don't. You have different homes. And so what you think is clean, they're going to not think is clean or vice versa. The understanding, this is often from the same culture, right? They're, they're very similar. But when you begin to live with somebody, you begin to say, oh, okay, what well, I thought was clean, you did not count as clean. Or even like what I think keeping a home looks like is not what you think. Or like, hey, we want to discipline the kids. Okay, well, I think that looks like this. Well, I think that looks like this. We often have very different uh, uh, things. I think one of the reasons that happens in the church, not just in the church, but in our culture in general, there are great things about the Internet, really good things, right? You can go listen to... Right, Martin Luther Jones will be preaching for if the Lord tarries a thousand years. It's great. It's, that is a tremendous thing. The difficult thing is now we have access to everything that's happening everywhere all the time, and so that we're not shaped by the people who are around by our local culture. We're shaped by that, yes, but we're also shaped by every culture everywhere to some degree because we have all of these things coming in, which makes us now all hodgepodges in some sense. Like we're, we have all of these influence that come in that's not a hundred years ago, right? You were shaped by who you lived with. Who was your family? What farm did you live on? Who was the pastor in your town? Who was like, what was happening in your community? You didn't know what was happening six hours down the road. Much less on the other side of the country, you weren't being shaped by what those people were doing. It was your local community. That's not, right? There are good things about not having that anymore, but I think there are also downsides, which makes us all a little more, hodgepodges of different influences. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, even funerals for pastors, every town you're in has different rules for how they do funerals. And all of them think, well, why would you not do it this way? Everybody should do it this way. But then it's, as pastors, you've got to figure out, like, what, when do you do this? To where do I stand? What do I do this? Because everybody's got their own different, which like years and years ago, they just started doing it that way. And now it's set. I, I mean, I pastor in Lawrenceburg for coming to before coming to Buck Run, they do funerals very differently in Lawrenceburg than they do here in Frankfurt. Well, like, we're 15 minutes down the road from each other, but it's this, the setup of, like, where I'm supposed to stand and where I go and I, the order in which they take people and some funeral homes bring everybody up front and some don't. And, right, it's a very different, because, again, even when you can be close, like, to your point, Christian, sometimes even when we're close to each other, our understanding of the world is sometimes different. We've just had different experiences that help to to shape some of those things, sometimes in wrong ways, but sometimes in not necessarily wrong ways. It's just different. We just see things, uh, see things differently. Does this make sense? All right, so the goal then would be to preach repentance from biblical sins, right, in a way the local context can understand, right? So J.D. is not wrong to press upon his, his Cambodian brother, hey, theft is wrong, but he needs to talk about it in a way that his Cambodian brother can understand. Uh, and then we need to cultivate the virtues of the local culture uh, when we can, right? Again, I wouldn't go into an African church and berate them and say, You're, you have a weak conscience, you must use drums. No, I, I want to understand why they're not using drums and say, yeah, that's probably the wisest thing. That's a good thing. I wouldn't want to force that uh, up, upon them. Let's talk about, uh, for a second, Paul's conscience. I want to read to you a, a quote. Uh, this is from uh, a couple of uh, missionary folks uh, who, who teach uh, for cross-cultural evangelism. 
uh, that, that J.D. Crowley uh, and, and Nacelli quote. Uh, this is on page 123 if you've got the book. Uh, they write, Western missionaries tended to assume that their consciences were advanced beyond that of the local people who they felt had little, if any, sense of right and wrong. And they took on themselves the task, the task of teaching moral scruples, all too often imposing new cultural rather than biblical values, and belittling or trampling on the local values of the, in the process. To understand the cultural forms of conscience is, critical, is of critical importance in missionary work. It carries implications for the conviction of sin as well as for cross-cultural ethics. When we feel that another does not have a proper conscience, we are tempted to develop one that matches ours. When we develop ethical systems, they tend to blend our cultural values together with biblical values and may not make sense to our target population. So you remember early, I think this is week one or two, week two, we, we talked about that even in your home, it's probably helpful in your home to have a category of God's rules and a category of mom and dad's rules. Right, that you're in our home, you need to follow these rules. Uh, and we have reasons why we have these rules, but these are not necessarily biblical rules, right? So right, when you, uh, after you brush your teeth, you rinse out the sink. That's a mom and dad rule, right? That's not a biblical rule, but when you have your own house, your sink can be as nasty as you want. That's up to you. But in our, in our house, when you brush your teeth, you rinse out the sink afterwards, right? So distinguishing between mom and dad's rules and, dad's, and God's rules Culturally, often we have sometimes have a hard time distinguishing between what is a biblical thing, what is biblically right and wrong, and what is sometimes culturally right and wrong. And I think one of the helpful things that's happening, if there is a helpful thing that's happening in our culture, is it's getting easier to determine that, right? That as the culture is becoming more and more aggressively anti-biblical, then it's easier then to, to differentiate between what the culture says is right and wrong and what the Bible says is, is right and wrong. Uh, which in some sense was a lot harder 60 years ago. Lots of people would have been in agreement about gender and sexuality and abortion. But they may not have been in agreement for the same reasons, right? That a lot of, some people would have been there because of biblical reasons, and some people would have been there because of cultural ones, because this is what they were told. This is the good thing, this is the bad thing. And so they believed that. So as culture has shifted, a lot of people's opinions have shifted because they were never believing that thing because the Bible said it. To begin with, they were believing it because it was part of the culture. As culture shifts, we tend to go with culture, right? If, if we're not tied to something else, when the culture shifts, we shift and we, and we go with it. Uh, so understanding that sometimes those things are, are tied, I think it's easier to tell uh, the difference between some of these things, uh, uh, between some of these, these things now. Uh, Again, this, this uh, missionary, missionaryologist writes, a North American going to live with the Iguana people uh, are, may be highly incensed at the occasional beating of an errant wife or at arranged marriages or at the marriages uh, of a young woman to an older man. And he said, but for the traditional folks, each of these seems to them wholly appropriate and wholesome. And yet, on the other hand, they are angered when North Americans come and fail to share food with them. All right, that food is above all things that mu which must be shared. And when such foreigners are invited to a meal, they fail to exercise careful self-restraint in eating meat, which is a limited and highly valuable food item. So self-restraint in that setting implies a consideration for the need of others and self-denial on, on their part. Right? That he's not suggesting that wife beating or the marriage of young women to older men, or that those things are right. They're not right. But it highlights that when we go into other cultures, that we, there can be things that can be truly wrong, but for cultural reasons, they have zero sensitivity to. And you're going to have to teach them how to have sensitivity to some of these issues, right? It's, it's hard for us to imagine going into a culture in which they would have no problem marrying a 13-year-old to a 45-year-old, but would be incensed that you didn't share your meat. That makes no sense to us, understanding we, we come from a different culture. It's helpful to, to go in and to realize these people are sinners, right? There are things happening in our culture that make no sense to... Christians in other parts of the world, right? There are, if you, you look at uh, what's happening and has happened over the last few years in the Methodist church, one of the reasons there has been a, a division in the Methodist church uh, over issues of gender and sexuality is because the African division of the Methodist church is saying to the American Methodist, we don't know why you're even having a discussion about these things. We don't understand, these things are clear in the scriptures, we don't understand why this is a fight, right? They're looking from Africa at the Americans and saying, we don't get you. Like, we don't, these things are very clear to us. We have no clue why you would even be having discussion of these things. So hear me, it's not just that we would look to other cultures and say, you, you've missed it. Yes, they have. Other cult cultures would have ways to look at us as Americans and say, you've missed it, right? The culture of death in America would be shocking to 
most Christians in other cultures around the world, right? We are one of the few countries for which abortion is legal up until the point of, uh, of birth. One of the few industrialized countries, countries in the world, right? We, we are a stench in that way to other countries because of our culture of death. They would look at us and say, what is wrong with you? Why would you not do that? So hear me. It's easy to look at other cultures and, and see their stuff. We, we have the same things too. We're not saying, excuse these things. When there's real sin, we, we want to teach on it, right? We want to expose it. We want to, to help them understand what's true and right according to what the Bible says. But we want to talk to real sin. We want to talk to them in a way in which they can understand and, and going to have to help them recalibrate their, recalibrate their conscience. Does that make sense? So before them, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think the way we, our culture looks at American chattel slavery is how, if the Lord tarries, eventually later, later generations will look at American abortion. It'll, I think they'll look and say, what, how did you get there? And the way we look at American slavery, we think, how did they not see that? How did they not? How did guys like Edwards, right? Uh, George Whitfield illegally brought slavery into Georgia, right? The, George Whitfield was one of the greatest evangelists who's ever lived, right? I, like the, all the founders of Southern owned slaves. Right? Some of these great theological minds, right, who have forgotten more about the Bible than I'll ever know. We look at those guys and we say, like, how did you, how did you miss something like that? I think it's that if we, if the Lord tarries long enough, I think eventually that's how future generations will view our generation, right? this 150-year period, and say, how'd you miss it? No. Yeah, no, but there'll be, a, yeah, there are, there are other things that, yeah. Yeah. Gives us some, I, I, I think sometimes we're, we're quick to judge guys who've come before us, and we're quick to judge them by modern standards, but then we're just, it's, it's really l- lacks humility to say, this guy was wrong on this issue, therefore he's wrong on everything. I'm like, I, I don't think that's true. Like, I, yeah, I, just, I think we can have some, some humility and say they could have been very wrong in the same way that I might be wrong on some stuff. Uh, and yeah, I can still be a Christian, right? God's, the grace still matters, gospel still matters, all those things are true. Um, yeah, that, I think we're in agreement. Yeah. Does that make sense? Anything else we need to say there? So the goal when we would go into cross-cultural settings would be, as best we can, to live an exemplary life before them, right? understanding that there are cultural things. If, if you were going to move to a Muslim country, you might give up your freedom to eat meat. Not because you're not free to eat meat, but you might give up your freedom to eat meat because you want to reach your Muslim neighbors, right? You, you want to reach them, so giving that up gives you an opportunity. That's part of living an exemplary life, right? That it's going to help to give you some bridges, Right? But even while you speak to issues of conscience that they don't yet have, right? You're, you're speaking to sins that they've not yet thought of, right? If you, if you were to go into, uh, into this culture, right, that, that he was talking about in, in uh, I think that's in Latin America, right? You would want to share your meat, right? You would want to share food, right? You would want to try to, in that sense, live an exemplary lifestyle before them. Be generous with your food. That's going to help build relationship that's going to buy you some equity to help to speak to the sins that they don't yet have. And if you go to Panama, if with Kenny and Cheryl, right? Kenny is basically a, a, a local now, right? Kenny and Cheryl don't care about time. Right? That's not, not how they think. Kenny could have spent a lot of time trying to force the locals to care about time, or, but now Kenny has shifted. And even when Kenny has something to do, right, when he's in hockey and he's, got, he's in hockey for a reason, he's got a project he's working on, when the villagers come and they come, into, they come, and they come to visit, what does Kenny do? He puts the project aside and he spends time with them, right? He says, that'll be there tomorrow. I'll come back to the work, I'll come back to the thing I'm trying to do, and I'm going to spend time with these people. That's why Kenny has been so successful, uh, and the Lord, I think the Lord has used him so well. It's not because he's trying to make them become Americans, right? They don't have to care about time. He uses then their sensibility to, to live an exemplary life. If Kenny was a guy who went there and was constantly saying, I'll talk to you tomorrow, I'll talk to you later, I've got to build this fence, or I've got to fix this faucet, he loses all credibility with, with the locals. Well, they say, this guy doesn't care about us. He cares more about his projects than he does about us. No, but Kenny has given them his time, which is the most valuable thing he can give them. And so when Kenny shows up, they listen, right? They have a, a you've seen this firsthand, JP. Or they, when Kenny shows up, they love him. His, his Spanish is, is uh, they make fun of his Spanish, but they love him, right? right? They give him a hard time about it, but they, but they love him because they know that Kenny, Kenny loves them. He's demonstrated his love and his care for them uh, by trying to prioritize those relationships that he, that he has with them.
All right, so we think about the Apostle Paul. What was Paul before he became a Christian? He was a Pharisee. Right? You think independent fundamentalists have an overactive conscience. Consider being a Pharisee, right? He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Do you think when Paul became a Christian, do you think there was a lot of recalibrating of the contents that Paul had to do? Oh, absolutely. And the Pharisees had rules about how much food you could lift from your plate to your face on a, on a Sabbath without it being work. And so they would, they would place food at certain places in the house because there was rules about how much food you could carry from one place to the other without it being work. You think about all the sort of rules that as a Pharisee you've had to live with. And now when Paul comes to faith, he's got to recalibrate his conscience. So if you, again, go back to the triangles, uh, there's going to be a huge section down here that Paul has all of these issues that, that he's burdened over that he has to recalibrate his conscience, which we know, obviously Paul does a ton of work on that. He writes in, in Romans, saying in 1 Corinthians, you can eat meat sacrificed to idols. As a Pharisee, Paul would have never done that. Right? It would have been an issue of his conscience, that, that calibrating for our conscience, our conscience for missions, really for any cross-cultural stuff, whether that's somewhere else or local, really have, we have to ask three questions. What stays? What goes? And what's missing? What am I burdened over that needs to stay? Right? So go back to JD in Cambodia. Right? He's burdened over theft. Well, that, that stays, right? That's... That's a biblical thing. That should stay. What goes? Well, some of that is going to have to be his cultural scruples over whether or not you can eat fruits out of somebody's tree, right? That's more of a cultural understanding of theft than it is a biblical understanding of theft. That one might, that one might go, right? It, it, which for him, he said it did. He was with a friend. They were cutting through a field. Guy picks a piece of fruit and hands it to him. That's legal, right? That's not a problem. Nobody sees that as theft. It's not an issue in Cambodia, right? And then what's missing? But what is not there that needs to be there, right? So for him, that was the category of stinginess towards my neighbor, of not being generous towards the, those that are around me. That was not something that he was burdened about before. But he realizes, yeah, this is something I should be burdened about. I should care about my neighbor. I should care about a heart of stinginess that does not want to be generous and, and to share with others. This is the, the work that Paul has to do is he has to ask himself what stays, what goes, and what's missing. This is really what we should always be asking of our conscience, but especially when we, when we encounter people who are of a different culture, right? What stays? what goes and what's missing. Does it make sense? All right, we're going to finish up. We got, we're going to do this. Christian liberty. How do we define Christian liberty? Often, we would define Christian liberty as essentially Christian liberty is the ability to do whatever I want as long as the Bible does not forbid it, right? The Bible doesn't forbid it. There's not a difficult case to be made. Christian liberty says I can do whatever I want. I want to make the case to you that Christian liberty is not saying cool, I get to do stuff now that I couldn't do before, uh, and I get to flaunt it and put it in everybody's face. I used to think it was wrong, and now I get to do it, and I can post on Facebook about it, and no one can say anything to me, right? I want to make a case that is not Christian liberty, right? Christian liberty is the freedom to discipline yourself to be flexible for the sake of the gospel. That's what Christian liberty is, the freedom to discipline yourself to be flexible for the sake of the gospel. Right, true Christian freedom is not exercising your liberty at every point, always, all the time, in every context. That's not true freedom, right? True freedom only comes from discipline, right? You know this, right? When many of you, I remember when I got to college and I realized I can go to Walmart and I can get whatever food I want. <laughs> no one can stop me. I can eat, I can eat junk all the time. Right? You, you realize, and you think as a, I was 17 when I moved to college, and you think, this is freedom. I'll have Wendy's every night. 11, eight, 11, 11 uh, night, 12 in the morning, right? We'll play basketball. We'll go to Wendy's. Wendy's is open in Williamsburg all night long, right? We'll just, right? You think that's true freedom, and then you figure out, that is a dangerous path to go down, right? Because that's not freedom, right? Freedom is the ability to discipline yourself, right? Freedom is not exercising everything that's in front of you. Freedom is not, if it's available, I will take it in. Right? We teach our kids that. Right? Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can stay up late doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can do these things doesn't mean that you should. The real freedom in our lives is always going to come not from the bare exercising of our rights, but real freedom is going to come from the ability to discipline ourselves for the sake of the gospel, to be flexible for the sake of the gospel. And when we discipline ourselves, that's, that's when we really get freedom, right? When you make sure that you're up early to get to class, right? You get to move to college and you think, nobody's here to wake me up. I can do whatever I want. I can skip, skip class, right? That's going to lead to awful places. Where does freedom come? Well, I got up early and I went to class. 
And then rather than going and hanging out with everybody, I, I went back to my dorm and I did my homework first. And because I went back to my, my dorm and I did my homework, now I'm not behind in class. Now I've done my stuff. Now I've got like time to do these other things that I would like to do. Right now I'm not perpetually behind. Now, right, that, that's where real freedom comes. And the same way you think about your, your conscience. Freedom comes when we are not controlled by our desires or preferences, but rather we can discipline ourselves. We can lay them aside when, when we need to. Uh, again, I, we, I mentioned uh, earlier, I talked to guys who say, I don't want to go to a church if they're going to make me wear a coat and tie. That's a really s- silly reason to go to a church. Uh, I've had the same conversation with people who said, I don't want to go to a church. Uh, that if you know that they feel like they have freedom to, the, to drink alcohol, and they would say, I don't want to go to this church because this church would require me as their pastor, or as being on staff, they would require me not to drink alcohol. I would say to them, then I think alcohol is a problem for you. If if it is to the level on which you would say, I would not serve these people who belong to Jesus, I would refuse to give it up to, to serve them, I would say, then I, I think then that's the problem, right? Not because you don't have freedom, but if you, have, if you do not have the ability to discipline yourself and to lay it aside, that to me is when I think it becomes an issue, right? So in the, in the same way, uh, like it's at Southern Seminary, if you're a student at Southern Seminary, you sign a part of every semester. When you register for classes, you've got to sign a, a document, right? And it's, these are the these are the code of conduct that I'm going to live up to. In that code of conduct, you're signing. I will not drink alcohol, right? So regardless of where your conscience may land, if you're a student at Southern Semin- Seminary, uh, I believe Boys College, though for most of them it would be illegal. Uh, I think they think they sign the same document. Uh, you are signing your name on a piece of paper that says I will not drink alcohol while I'm a student there. If you go to seminary and you cannot make it through, you sign your name on a sheet of paper every single semester, and yet you still drink through seminary, that to me is an issue. Right? If you're saying, I will not do this, and yet you still then cannot lay it aside, that to me is a sign that this is a problem. Right? The problem isn't always that we have the freedom. The problem becomes when we realize we can't give up the freedom, when we are reluctant to lay it aside. Right? When there's a real reason we might lay this aside, if we find that we can't do that, or we're really reluctant to do that, we don't want to do that, right? We all think, well, I can quit this anytime. Well, maybe, but for most of us, that's not the case, right? We, Hannah, we, we do, anybody know the whole 30? We, we do that every now and then. I'm a terrible eater. And I never think I have a problem with sugar until we do the whole 30. You do 30 days, no gluten, no dairy, no sugar, no fun. It is an awful 30 days. <laughs> and every time Hannah says, you know, you do this to help learn how these things affect your body. And every year I say, sugar makes me pleasant, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's what I've learned. When you take sugar away, I'm not nearly as pleasant. Why? I never think I have a problem until it comes time to lay it aside, right? And it's like, oh, I don't eat that bad. And it's totally fine until then I have to put it to the side. And then I realize, oh, okay, this is a problem, right? I, I, I need this way more than I thought it did. Freedom comes from exercising the ability to discipline ourselves, not to always have a bare uh, grasp for uh, a bare grasp for our, our rights. I, I want you to again to think about uh, Romans 15. This is what Christ has done for us, right? That we follow the example of Christ. That let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him, himself up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it was written, the reproach of those who reproached you fell on me. Right? That Christ came to die for sinners, right? For those who were enemies with him. Right? He, he, uh, Philippians says that, he, that, that the equality with God was not something that he grasped, but he held on to, but he emptied himself into the form of a servant to go to death on a cross for the sake of us. We can then follow in the footsteps of Christ by the help of the Holy Spirit in us and, when appropriate, lay down our rights, right? Lay down our preferences for the sake of our brothers. That's what Christ has done for us. God would have been just to not send Jesus and let us all go to hell. He would, it would not have been unjust for God to leave us in our sin. God would have been just. It would not have been merciful, but it would have been just. God would have been just. God would have committed no sin. He would have committed no injustice to leave us in our sin and allow us to all go to hell. But God was merciful. He sent his son to die for us, that we did not deserve it. He showed mercy to us. This is what we can do to others. We can lay aside our preferences, lay aside our rights, rather than hold on to them for the sake of our brother, right? So that we, we're willing to put others above ourselves. This is what love is. We're willing to say, I care more about your walk with Christ than I do about exercising my particular preference uh, or, or my particular right. Uh, 